Constructive Ambiguity in the EDI Statements of Western European Classical Music Organizations. Please note that this article is in progress and will have mistakes as well as two different citation styles. Abstract. In this article, I apply the notion of constructive ambiguity to the EDI statements of several Western European classical music organizations and ensembles. I analyze how constructive ambiguity can be and is used to avoid accountability and true meaningful investment in historically marginalized communities and artists. The organizations include the LA Phil, Lincoln Symphony Orchestra, BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, Decca Records, Audra Deck Records, Slip Disc, New Music USA, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the Oakland East Bay Symphony, Chiniki Orchestra, and NMC Recordings. In the end, I argue for the need to have concrete and meaningful goals in the long-term investment of historically marginalized artists and their communities. Introduction The term constructive ambiguity is one generally attributed to the former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, See footnote 1. It is a deliberate and tactical method of negotiating often under what are considered to be difficult and irreconcilable differences between nations. Michael Byers, Dresden Pehar, and others have studied the use of constructive ambiguity in international law, UN Security Council resolutions, and peace agreements around the world from the 20th and 21st centuries. The same scholars have critiqued constructive ambiguity in several case studies from the past 50 years where the issues at hand were either amplified by the negotiating tactic or the issues were thrown under the rug only to resurface later often in more violent and traumatic ways. Despite the negotiations in these cases being unsuccessful, as a negotiator the U.S. was able to move forward its agenda because of the ordered chaos it created. The tactic is not known as a method to effectively resolve international issues between countries. For example, the U.S. has destabilized whole continents with a foreign policy rooted in constructive ambiguity while remaining a tenuous economic and military ally to forward its own political and economic agenda. See footnote 3. Throughout Henry Kissinger's time as U.S. Secretary of State, he supported coups in Chile, Argentina, helped to destabilize relations between Middle Eastern countries, and supported the U.S.'s involvement in the Vietnam War. He believed that for the U.S. to remain a global superpower, it would need to continually and strategically cause ordered chaos to distract and prevent other countries from achieving global dominance. See footnote 4. The U.S. gains power through constructive ambiguity by creating and supporting various conflicts around the world and then situating itself as a chief negotiator. This tactic is only constructive for the negotiator and destructive for those in any given conflict. This gives the U.S. the ability to create a false narrative about its intentions while being the puppet master. Constructive ambiguity remains the preferred choice in U.S. foreign policy in the 21st century, see footnote 5, and there are many correlations between it and how the Western European classical music, or WECM, industry has attempted to tackle its colonial diversity and equity issues. Many organizations in Wecom will create narratives of change and acceptance publicly, but continue to fail in who they hire and or program. I argue that ambiguous EDI statements help to support the colonial, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal echo chamber organizations and ensembles have created throughout the past few decades. While organizations may spend money on creating EDI offices, usually led by a white person, or flashy social media narratives and using BIPOC people in their marketing, the long-term and meaningful support of marginalized artists has yet to happen, despite years of promises and excuses from a majority of institutions. This article will analyze EDI mission statements from orchestras, recording labels, and other arts organizations in the UK and US to better understand how constructive ambiguity is embedded in them and how it's used to continue the wide agenda. See footnote 6. It must be reiterated that this tactic is only constructive for the negotiator and only destructive for the two sides attempting to resolve the conflict. Constructive ambiguity may be used both consciously and unconsciously to avoid true EDI change, similar to how unconscious biases work. For this analysis to be successful, 
I will define the two sides in our conflict with BIPOC, disabled, and LGBTQ plus artists on one side, and on the other side we have the privileged cis white het upper class male artists. The negotiators in the middle are the institutions we all work with throughout the industry. I chose these two groups of people because there are many statistics and reports from the US, Canada, and UK that show that a majority of arts funding and opportunities go to white-led organizations and white male artists. There is a history of erasure in our industry that particularly impacts indigenous and black artists, see footnote 7, and we continue to let coloniality in the new music scene negatively affect marginalized artists and our identities, see footnote 8. Meaningful change would involve leaving one's often racist and gendered Weka musical aesthetics aside and investing in marginalized communities long term, see footnote 11. This would include the full stop of gatekeeping and the use of excuses such as we select on merit and not race or gender, see footnote 12. This perspective, and many like it, assume that we are all treated equally by our economy and industry, and that the same manual labor from one person will pay the same wages to all people. We know this is not true thanks to orchestral programming statistics, see footnote 13, gender pay disparity statistics, see footnote 14, inaccessible economies to people with disabilities, see footnote 15, inaccessible education systems, see footnote 16, and racist banking lending practices, among other statistics, see footnote 17. Indeed, the problem of the cis het white upper class self and ego being unconditionally supported and reaffirmed in our minority North Globe society is one of the greatest challenges and distractions we face on a day-to-day -day basis in and outside of the industry, see footnote 18. White fragility, ignorance, and guilt also play a large role in whether change happens in the industry. Constructive ambiguity, I argue, lets white people and people in power avoid their fragility and guilt while seeming like allies. This article may not make sense to you, and that's okay. If there is one thing you should take from this article, especially if you are in a position of power within the Wacom industry, it is that you may have to step aside and give your power and resources to people who do not think like you. In order to be more equitable, you may have to give your power to artists who do not make art like you, who make art that you do not understand, who critique you, who make you aware of your own white skin, who make you aware of your privilege, who are angry at you and ultimately want or need to collaborate with you and your organization to further their career. This is especially true in the U.S. where individual federal artist grants were removed in 1996 by a Republican Congress. Let us remember that if we do not follow through with equitable change and we keep and we continue to keep underrepresented people outside of majority white institutions, that is segregation. For further reading on white fragility, I recommend Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, see footnote 19, as well as Dylan Robinson's To All Who Should Be Concerned, see footnote 20. It is beyond the scope of this article to explain what white fragility is, what systemic racism and gendered conventions are, but I will be making connections between them and how constructive ambiguity is used to further oppress and silence BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ plus artists. It should be noted that problems with D'Angelo's method of talking about race has been called into question as it tends to center whiteness. I will state my outright disgust, my bias for constructive ambiguity in our industry. I wouldn't be writing this article if I didn't hate it. There have been many case studies on global issues that have shown how it can further exacerbate problems instead of helping to find meaningful change or peaceful agreements. See footnote 21. Instead, I will argue for a well-defined, planned, and EDI mission statement that leads to actual change defined by and for BIPOC, disabled, and LGBTQ plus artists themselves. A well-defined EDI plan that is public and transparent also allows for accountability, which is something an ambiguous statement helps to avoid. Section 1. Constructive Ambiguity in Orchestras the Los Angeles Philharmonic was founded in 1919 by William Andrews Clark Jr., see footnote 22. To date, it has only ever had male conductors and is currently led by Gustav Dudamel. Its yearly operating budget is about $120 million. Clearly, they could afford to change if they wanted to. 
Its EDI statement can be found online, see footnote 23. The statement is quite vague, like others I will analyze. It reads, Over the past 100 plus years, the LA Phil's understanding of what we now call EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion, has also grown more complex. What began in the 1920s as rare and isolated moments of diverse representation on stage has, over time, given way to more holistic approaches to diversity as well as considerations of cultural equity and inclusivity. As the organization continues to evolve, we are guided by the words of LA Phil Music and artistic director Gustav Judamel, who said, The future is the present. We take responsibility for the future through our actions and aspirations today. The following document, a summary of our beliefs and commitments to EDI, is intended to do just that, help shape our future by informing our organizational priorities and investments in the present. The statement will act as a guide as we work to A, create a more culturally equitable, diverse, and inclusive organization, and B, contribute to a more empathetic and just society through music and the arts. It is also a living document that will grow and change as we do. A commitment to EDI is ongoing. There will always be more to learn and more to work to, and more work to do as we strive to act consciously and conscientiously. The statement contains constructive ambiguity throughout with no clear goals set in this quoted section or the rest of the EDI webpage. We have a sense that change is in the future and that we take responsibility to quote, we take responsibility for the future through our actions and aspirations today. But who is the we in this statement? Is there someone who ultimately does take responsibility for the lack of EDI commitments? Holistic approaches, quote unquote, are undefined. There's a vague sense of bringing an equitable future to the present in the second paragraph. It reaffirms the organization's commitment to EDI in the third paragraph again, without defining what that means, whether it is in the hiring of underrepresented artists, outreach programs, work on programming, living or dead underrepresented composers, etc. The last paragraph tends to be repeated in most, most organizations' EDI statements and, as I will explain, can be one of the most negative uses of constructive ambiguity. By claiming that e, the EDI document is living without any set goals in mind or well-defined plans, it creates an ambiguous space that is hard to keep accountable. This lets an organization claim that it is being equitable while still performing all-white male composer programs. See footnote 24. Constructive ambiguity also provides no challenge to what has now become known as a diversity concert. See footnote 25. These concerts tend to be all brown and black composers and usually all men. This particular diversity concert by the LA Phil on 30th of September 2022 does feature one women composer, Gabriela Ortiz. This is gendered tokenism without a well-defined plan, racist, gendered, and ableist habits are unchallenged and true equity will never be reached. Similar programming habits can be found in many U.S. and U.K. orchestras, see footnote 26, and they will continue without any equitable accountability since there is no well-defined diversity plan. This is not to dismiss the work that the LA Phil has done and continues to do through their fellows program, for example, and outreach. I am simply wanting to analyze the destructive ambiguity in the ADI statements and how that ambiguity can hinder holistic change. The most recent programming statistics from the League of American Orchestras, and in partnership with other organizations, confirm that white, dead, and alive male composers still hold a monopoly on rehearsal and performance time in the U.S. They enjoy a whopping 70% of performance time. See footnote 27. The Lincoln Symphony Orchestra, located in Lincoln, Nebraska, was founded in 1927-1928 and currently has an operating budget of around 1.1 million. See footnote 28. The orchestra does not have a public EDI statement, though I suspect a generic one does exist and is shared with potential employees, for example. There is an impact webpage. See footnote 29. The only statistics that help to focus in on EDI commitments include the 4,000 students invited each year to concerts and the over 1,000 complimentary tickets given to underserved families, as well as immigrants and refugees. The orchestra also provides some sort of 
transportation to underserved families. So this is undefined and how one accesses it is unknown from the web page. With no public EDA statement, we find the gravest type of constructive ambiguity. No statement means the public and its employees cannot hold the orchestra accountable for its EDI initiatives. Furthermore, it is almost impossible to know what underserved means and if it is truly helping to create an equitable and accessible industry. What are the demographics being helped? Where are the BIPOC, disabled, and LGBTQ plus community? Without a visible EDI statement that hints at an organization's knowledge of the systemic issues faced by people, can it be said that any good is being done? It would be more helpful if on the impact page there were goals and a well-defined action plan for how the orchestra intends to meet its community's needs. By community, I mean both its immediate local community and the industry-wide community that it is a part of. Providing complimentary tickets and transportation to underserved communities while performing mostly all-white male music is a contradiction. See footnote 30. Contradiction that is supported by the constructive ambiguity from having no well-defined EDI statement. This prevents equitable change from happening while providing something for the organization to share on its web page and social media accounts that appears to be equitable in nature. In the end, with no defined EDI statement, the only thing that happens is a smokescreen that allows for the status quo of gendered, ableist, and racist habits to continue. The BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, based in Glasgow, was founded in 1935, and the average yearly operating budget for a BBC symphony is about £6.1 million. See footnote 31. It is yet another orchestra that has only ever had white male lead conductors. For those outside of the UK, the BBC and its various organizations, including its orchestras, are primarily funded through public funds. Unlike the other organizations I'm analyzing here, the BBC as a whole, the, the entire organization, not just the orchestra, it has a 41-page diversity and inclusion action plan, with the current one met to serve from 2021 to 2023. See footnote 32. The BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra itself does not have a publicly available EDI statement, see footnote 33, but the BBC as a whole, which includes about 20,000 strong workforce, workforce, does have an action plan. It opens its diversity and inclusion plan with um, Miguel Gonzalez saying, diversity isn't simply about assembling the right ratio of people with different characteristics or identities. It's about understanding why those differences are valuable. Firstly, you start to think beyond legally protected characteristics, characteristics and you embrace all the nuanced varieties of us, those who make up our workforce and our audiences. See footnote 34. This is already a more nuanced understanding of EDI than the previous two orchestras I looked at. She continues with, quote, So we need to think not only of numbers in terms of representation, but also in terms of the culture created around difference. On screen, is diversity always a specialist topic or is it embedded in our programs? Off screen and in the workplace, are you getting the best out of team members? Are they fully engaged? Are they bringing their true selves to their task and being allowed to add the value that naturally comes with being included? See footnote 35, end quote. The plan is concerned with diversity and inclusion beyond just quotas. It is looking at the work culture of the BBC and advocating for its employees and audiences to engage with EDI in a nuanced way in and outside of work. Some of the achievements in the plan from 2016 to 2020 include having a clear EDI statement of intent, inclusive cultural training mandatory for team leaders, a BBC disability passport, a thousand LGBTQ plus allies, I'm not really sure what that is, reformed recruitment process, more diverse recruitment, the fair paycheck, a new approach to flexible working with 96% of vacancies now advertise as flexible. Additionally, they set a hiring goal to reach by 2020 that includes 50% gender equity, 20% Black, Asian, and ethnic minority hires, and 12% in disability and LGBTQ plus hires. 
There are problems with the 50-50 gender goals which many workplaces have because there are more than two genders. Speaking as someone who's non-binary here. This is, I will acknowledge, at least attempting to rectify the prejudices women identifying people face. The BBC is also now looking at including non-binary and non-conforming gender identities. See footnote 36. The goals in BAME, disability, and LGBTQ plus hires were not met for 2020, according to the report, but they are increasing. It is important to remember that these numbers are for the entire BBC workforce, which is about 20,000 people, and not specific to the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra. Despite the BBC-wide EDI plan, we still find issues in diversity in composer programming and performer hires. The next three concerts in August of 2022, for example, include only dead white male composers. See footnote 37. I believe that without a specific EDI goal for the orchestra, the distance between the orchestra and the BBC-wide diversity goal will continue to be a space of constructive ambiguity. This will allow for the orchestra to remain performing all white male composer programs, for example, and escape accountability since the orchestra itself is not in charge of diversity and inclusion plan. This may also be due to an internal issue to the orchestra where none of its immediate administrative staff is focused on EDI issues. Section 2. Constructive Ambiguity in Recording Labels Decca Records is a British recording label established in 1928 by Edward Lewis, see footnote 38. Outside of Britain, it operates under the Universal Music Group umbrella. It has no publicly available EDI statement, but its parent or partner company, Universal Music, does have a so-called social responsibility webpage, see footnote 39. Their statement reads, it's the universal language. It inspires us, moves us, thrills us, heals us, and ultimately unites us all. As the world's leading music company, it's our responsibility to nurture music and to foster artistry and self-expression. In a world that desperately needs to find more common ground, there is no better way to provide it than through music. Using the collective power of our passionate community of music lovers, ranging from employees to artists to fans, we support and partner with organizations around the globe that are working towards meaningful positive change and social responsibility, end quote. The statement assumes that Western European art and popular music is universal. The idea that Western European art and popular music is a universal language can be traced back to Schumann, who Dr. Kira Thurman notes as saying, Wecom speaks the most universal of languages one by which the soul is freely yet indefinably moved. Only then is it at home, end quote. Thurman further states, to quote, More importantly, to 19th century thinkers, only German music remained pure enough, spiritual enough, and unmarked by the aesthetic and moral deprivation of Italian music to express the universal message of art, capital A. By proposing that universal music was serious, pure, and soulful, and by positioning German music as the only true expression of these universal values, German aesthetics, nationalists, and even politicians transformed a nationalist message into a universalist idea. By 1870s, according to the musicologist Richard Teruskin, to quote, instrumental music was identified in the minds of many Europeans, not just Germans, as being to quote <laughs> Russian pianist and composer Anton Rubinstein, a German art, and all the quotes. <laughs> this reveals a contradiction between Decca's universality belief in the music they record and what they mean by social responsibility. We must ask, I ask, what is social responsibility and for whom? These two competing ideas create constructive ambiguity, and damages Decca's mission to be more equitable. The statement does not define music or the musicians that it wants to support. It does not define what common ground is and what communities need to find common ground. It also does not define which organizations it is working with to further meaningful positive, to further meaningful positive change and social responsibility. There are no statistics to see how the recorded catalog is helping in its social responsibility mission. The catalog itself does not provide a way to see 
the marginalized artists it is supporting. Though on the landing page on the 5th of August of 2022, Sheku Kanemason is featured. See footnote 40. Without a well-defined EDI statement and goals, I would call Connor Mason's feature tokenism. As I have stressed with other organizations that don't have an EDI statement or goals, it will be impossible to hold DECA records accountable for equitable practices now and in the future. The constructive ambiguity here gives DECA the ability to continue recording majority white musicians and composers, which is easily seen when glancing at the catalog. See footnote 41. How do we know DECA is equitable? How can we hold DECA accountable externally? Without a statement, there is nothing to change because to them, there is no problem. With this, constructive ambiguity is an easy way to continue building a majority white catalog. Similarly, Ultra Deck Records has no EDI statement or goals and has recently tweeted about the lack of gender representation in their catalog. See footnote 42. Their stance is that the label is artist-led, quote, and that the label in no way restricts what these artists record. This is yet another passive way to support diversity and inclusion and passes the so-called burden of EDI to its artists, to these artists who are leading the label with no guidance. This type of constructive ambiguity is rooted in passivity, masking as progressiveness. It is another way to avoid confronting EDI work and to never be accountable for an equitable catalog and business. The logic is similar in how Republicans in the U.S. continually use the state's rights tactic to overturn abortion rights and book bans that challenge white supremacy. It leaves change to happen organically amongst the many artists that Audre Deck collaborates with. Equitable change, however, cannot happen without clear goals. Artist-led ambiguity then helps to sustain the cis, white, het, upper-class male musician, something easily seen in their available catalog. Additionally, Audre Deck Records continues to use blind and merit-based artist selection, see footnote 43. In the conclusion, I will write about the issues with these hiring methods, which assumes, with hiring and selecting methods, which assume that all people are treated equally in our economy and industry. Without a clear EDI statement and goals, as we have seen in other organizations, change simply doesn't happen or is masked as slow change. I continue to ask slow for whom. Section 3, Constructive Ambiguity and Other Arts Organizations. Slip Disc was founded in 2007 by, quote, author and broadcaster Norman Lebrecht with the aim of providing swift and reliable inside information on Western European classical music and related arts, end quotes. It does not have a diversity inclusive statement, surprise there, and the consequences of that can be seen in its often racist and sexist reporting. Slip Disc is on the extreme side of what can happen when an organization sort of wallows in constructive ambiguity and the name of the white patriarchy or free speech. It misleads its readers on issues of systemic racism with headlines that read, to quote, how an English orchestra conducts ethnic cleansing. See footnote 43 for that one. And continues to harass women musicians, in particular such as Yu Wang, who often, often ignoring her performance in favor of reviewing her clothes. See footnote 45. The writing style varies greatly from when cis white het male musicians are reviewed see footnote 46, versus BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ plus musicians. Surprise! <laughs> They're rarely, if ever, reviewed by Sliptis. When a cishat men's clothes reveal his tattoos, it somehow doesn't affect the voice. See footnote 47. Yet when Yucha Wang wears a dress, she feels reflects her relationship to the music, it may, to quote, wreck her career. See footnote 48. Whether it is in the name of free speech or not, the constructive ambiguity between slip disk and having no EDI statement is a shining example of how an organization can avoid total EDI accountability and even knowledge of and continue to support a mostly white cishet male gaze in the Wacom industry. In comparison, 
New Music USA, which also has no diversity statement available, though they do have the Real Change Fund, see footnote 49, Diversity Archives, see footnote 50, and have continued to make awardees of their programs public, or the statistics of those, see footnote 51. They also make their impact easily viewable online, see footnote 52. A few of the statistics from the 2021 grant season include 73% of individual grant awardees identified as BIPOC, 60% of awardees identified as women and non-binary. There are some quite restrictive geographical requirements that severely affect people working outside of New York State with New York State artists receiving about 84% of yearly funding. See the breakdown here, see footnote 53. Uh, the breakdown is 49% of the grants are available without geographic restriction, 35 is restricted to New York City, 11% is restricted to New York State, 2% to New Jersey, and 2% to California. They also usually give about 1% of their yearly funds to artists working in Pennsylvania. Well, New Music USA does have impressive funding, supporting funding support for New York-based underrepresented artists, there seems to be no publicly available action plan on diversity and inclusion. One main concern I have raised in this article is that any sort of constructive ambiguity with regards to EDI will severely and negatively affect BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ plus artists in the long and short term. Goals should be clearly stated, and although New Music USA has impressive statistics for BIPOC and women non-binary artists, there are currently no available statistics on disabled and LGBTQ plus artists. New Music USA does, however, have this statement about a third of the way down on their impact page to quote, New Music USA stands in opposition to injustice and bias against all marginalized communities, including Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and other people of color, immigrants, refugees, the religiously oppressed, LGBTQIA plus communities, women and marginalized genders, and people with disabilities. See footnote 54, end quote. Statements like these are ambiguous because although one can state their support for underrepresented people, there is no way to hold the organization accountable for how they will show their support now or in the future. There are no statistics available specifically for the impact New Music USA has on indigenous artists, immigrants, refugees, religiously oppressed and disabled musicians. Solidarity is important, but it does not help artists pay rent. Solidarity is often used as part of the marketing narrative organizations construct for public consumption. Please know I am not accusing New Music USA of anything, and am merely focusing on how constructive ambiguity is embedded in statements and the effects ambiguity has on underrepresented artists and communities. By comparison, the American Composers Forum has a diversity mission statement and goals clearly articulating their intention to raise BIPOC awardees and applicants to 60% by fiscal year 2025. See footnote 55. Ambiguity still exists when it comes to disabled and LGBTQ plus artists and the goals, which seems to be a trend amongst organizations I am analyzing. One thing uh, I, I didn't write, but I wanted to add to this section is that when you have an ambiguous EDI statement, um, and there's leadership change in any one organization, that leader can then sort of continue the white agenda um, without being held accountable if there's no plan already set. It's not to say that plans can, you know, can't be changed once they're public, but I think it, it would be great for organizations that are doing the work, like New Music USA, to put out a plan. Um, just so there's more transparency in case there is leadership change, admin change, or whatever. Section 4. Constructive Honesty and Commitment to Equity The Oregon Shakespeare Festival, OSF, is a regional theater in Ashland, Oregon. Their yearly operating budget is around $40 million. They host eight or more shows a year in three separate spaces that include a black box, an open-air theater, and a traditional indoor theater, plus an unofficial park menu. Full disclosure, I worked for OSF in 2015. OSF's diversity and inclusion statement is undergoing review and available at the time I was writing this article. See footnote 56. 
Their mission statement, however, does include their commitment to being inclusive, and I suspect the new diversity and inclusion statement will be well-defined. See footnote 57. I worked at OSF in 2015 as an assistant sound designer through their FAIR program. At that time, they were producing several shows with all marginalized actors and designers, such as a Shakespeare show with an all-Vietnamese or Latinx cast. Additionally, they have historically given free tickets to high schools in the region and have collaborated and funded projects with smaller partner theater companies, see footnote 58, run by underrepresented artists from California and Washington State. While introducing new shows and actors and designers to majority white audiences, OSF has continued to make most of their operating budget from ticket sales year to year, putting to rest that racist and false narrative that orchestras consistently use that underrepresented artists often categorize as unknown lead to low ticket sales. I've yet to find what research orchestras use to say this. I suspect that it's made up because I can't find any sort of study that says, you know, an unknown ar artist leads to low ticket sales. Uh, but see footnote 59. In 2022, OSF had hired 73% BIPOC actors and musicians and 63% BIPOC creative teams. See footnote 60. OSF also supports a robust internship program aimed at underrepresented people that pays for travel to and from OSF, housing, provides a stipend. See footnote 61. This alone has created a large pool of people who now actively work in the theater field across the nation from NYC to Ashland, Oregon. Although no diversity statement is available now, one can see that OSF's multi-pronged approach and commitment to diversity and inclusion is more than just a fad or marketing scheme to try and get funding. They are committed to building the careers of BIPOC, disabled, and LGBTQ plus artists from when they are in K through 12, from when they are K to 12 students, then they're emerging artists, and finally becoming a professional freelancer. No Wacom institution can say that they are as committed to diversity and inclusion, and are as deeply effective as OSF has been. The time and resources OSF invests in underrepresented artists is what Wacom institutions need to do in order to help remake our increasingly disparaged industry. OSF's actions leave little room for constructive ambiguity day to day and long term. This is what is needed in Wacom. The Oakland East Bay Symphony is based in California, with Michael Morgan directing from 1990 to 2021 due to his unfortunate death in 2021, see footnote 62. The orchestra has a general vision statement with no diversity focus yet. It has had, yet it has had super high diversity in programming male, black and brown composers while Morgan was alive and principal conductor. With no concrete and publicly available EDI vision, it will be interesting to see what the orchestra will do in future years as they move to working with another director. Changes in programming often follow changes in principal conductors and or artistic directors. Constructive ambiguity favors the personal aesthetics of those in charge rather than supporting the true equity of one's immediate community of BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ plus artists. Ambiguity and diversity statements may let an incoming director, for example, focus on recording and performing another Beethoven symphony cycle or another Mahler symphony cycle because this is what an unchecked patriarchal capitalist racist and ableist field deems as the ultimate opportunity for any conductor and orchestra. With constructive ambiguity deeply embedded in an organization's mission, there is nothing to challenge the status quo of the field, and thus an organization going through major changes, whether artists, artistic director, musicians, administrators, or board members, an organization can lose any progress they have made in diversity quite easily. Chiniki Orchestra is, quote, Europe's first majority black and ethnically diverse orchestra, and performs a mixture of standard orchestra repertoire along with the works of black and ethnically diverse composers, both past and present, end quote, see footnote 63. It performs several times a year across the UK and Europe. Their diversity and inclusion statement is quite vague, like many I have shown above, with one line devoted to underrepresented artists that reads, quote, 
The organization aims to be a catalyst for change, realizing existing diversity targets within the industry by increasing the representation of black and ethnically diverse musicians in British and European orchestras, end quote. See footnote 64. This does not provide a path forward for an organization, nor does it make it easy to hold the organization accountable over time and publicly. Something interesting that has come up in comparing all these institutions is that regardless of how ambiguous or well-defined a diversity statement is, that does not have a direct correlation to true diversity and inclusion within the organization. Both Chiniki and the Oakland East Bay Symphony, for example, have quite ambiguous statements on diversity, yet they are both leading the field when it comes to hiring underrepresented performers and programming underrepresented composers. Though more work still needs to be done there. Although their current practices are fantastic in of, of, in of themselves, and when compared to their majority white peer orchestras, ambiguous and or non-existent diversity statements leave an opportunity for progress to be lost and for little to no accountability down the line. NMC Records in Britain and Ireland has a great plan to attack diversity and equity, at least I think. It is super well defined, publicly available, and transparent. See footnote 65. Their inclusivity action plan includes the following point. points. Organization development, participation in music masters, I'm in diversity and inclusion program. Governance, we will ensure a 50-50 gender representation on board, on the board, regularly assess and audit board skills and expertise, appoint an EDI inclusion board, champion, monitor delivery of DEI outcomes. For the workforce, they will sign up to targeted work experience schemes, review recruitment and selection procedures to reach diverse candidate pools. In artistic, we will agree targets and action plans so that everyone, including those with protected characteristics, can access the opportunities we offer. Our forward release schedule will include at least 50% of releases featuring composers who identify as women. By December 2022, we will double the number of BIPOC people. They define as African, Caribbean, Southeast, and Southeast Asian. We will include composers and artists who identify as disabled. We will actively seek to encourage diversity and partner organizations with whom they work with. And in education, it says we will ensure that diversity and inclusion objectives are integral in engaging participants and artists in all education activities delivered by NMC and partners. A key aim of the strategy is to target new projects in areas of lowest artistic provision and socioeconomic disadvantage. They also include the following disclaimer. This will continue to be an evolving area of work, and we are committed to being open about the challenges we face and the advances we make. Several end quote end their bullet points. Several of the points in the plan are measurable, including the 50-50 gender composer goal, as well as doubling in ethnically diverse composers from 19 to 38 percent. The constructive ambiguity, however, is embedded in the goal to include disabled artists, who I assume are the performers and composers. It would be interesting to know why NMC has no data points for this demographic. Adding them to the goals would only decrease the ambiguity and increase the effect. Also, there's more than two genders. <laughs> Most constructive ambiguity I would label as negative, as it gives an institution a way to avoid accountability on diversity and inclusion. However, I do see the disclaimer offered at the bottom of the NMC webpage as a type of positive ambiguity when it reads, this will be, this will continue to be an evolving area of work and then provides the contact details to their director of development, who is currently Alex Wright. This is different from previously mentioned EDI statements who say similar, who have similar disclaimers, but then don't offer a way to continue the conversation. By offering the disclaimer, a well-defined plan and contact details to a specific person within the organization, NMC has provided a direct line to continue the conversation with the public and allowed us to hold them accountable through the proper channel should we ever feel the need to. This decreases the amount of ambiguity between all parties involved and gives a clear path forward for the support of BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ plus artists should they want to work with NMC. 
This transparency also helps to redistribute the emotional labor involved in making change. Instead of it being the sole responsibility of underrepresented artists to speak out, cishet white allies can use the publicly available action plan to hold NMC accountable. I will say, though, the catalog is majority white, and there is no... There's some targets, but it's hard to... Like, with the other recording businesses, um, it's hard to sort of see on their website what the change is. Conclusion, 46 minutes later. I am not interested in empty responses haphazardly written by organizations I mentioned in this article via social media or email. Please, please don't contact me. The only thing those responses serve is to distract from the change that you need to do and to keep constructive ambiguity and diversity and equity. As I said before, it is cheap marketing and I'm tired of it. I'm really tired. I'm tired. <laughs> These immediate responses dismiss the point of the article and usually read along the lines of change is slow, we are aware of the issues and are working on it. I am not here to do the work for you, for these organizations. I am interested in immediate change and meaningful reconfiguration of our industry that commits to enact diversity and equity for the artists who identify as BIPOC, disabled, and or LGBTQ+. This means what some would call a radical redistribution of resources and letting underrepresented artists define how they use them rather than letting the hierarchies in our industry defining the process for us. See footnote 66. Constructive ambiguity serves white-led organizations in the end. And although the pandemic did affect our entire industry and shut down many organizations and individual careers, it has and continues to more severely affect the careers of BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ plus artists, more so than that of the careers of upper class cis white hat male artists. What few opportunities we had pre-pandemic were erased and programs instead continued to feature all white dead European male musicians for the usual racist, sexist, and ableist lies or excuses like ticket or rec ticket or recording sales plummet with unknown composers funding because of this because of the pandemic funding was prioritized to emergency living grants rather than art making i have come to know many artists who have been forced to pivot careers entirely effectively killing their art making due to our increasingly unstable economy rising inflation and stagnant opportunities and wages Constructive ambiguity in the EDI statements of organizations, then, is another nail in the coffin for the careers of BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ artists. Ambiguous mission statements on diversity and equity allows organizations to continue to maintain, uh, to continue maintaining unchallenged the status quo of the white cis hat male musicians over that of BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ plus artists. I do not mean to erase the meaningful work that has been done by many organizations and individuals that I have and have not mentioned in this article, but I do want to stop and recognize one of the biggest hurdles preventing our entire industry from changing. When we hear, when marginalized artists hear statements like, we are aware of the issue and are working on it, our record label is artist-led and we do not, as a label, make decisions on what or who artists record. We use blind auditions, so we are not racist, ableist, or sexist. What we are hearing and what is actually happening is people in charge avoiding fault and accountability for their white supremacist, ableist, and sexist behavior. Constructive ambiguity leads to passive support for change and leads to no accountability. People in charge, regardless if you are white or steeped in whiteness, you need to take full responsibility for the pathetic change or lack thereof happening, but you must enact corrective action that leads to true equity. Within one year or less, it's not that hard to do. <laughs> Orchestra managers continue to say that they program three years in advance and change is slow, yet none, can, none of them can show us what their plans are three years from now. Show us the plan. And many orchestra programs are reviewed in 2021, now two years ago. 
those same orchestras are still programming similar, if not the exact same repertoire. See footnote 67. In many instances, white male musicians on Twitter and in person have said something to the effect of all opportunities are being given to underrepresented artists, so there are none for me. See footnote 68. This type of behavior is imbued with ignorance and is what I specifically call white ignorance. It's a racist refrain, and it focuses on their individual experience versus the historical white supremacist truth in our global minority North society. It does not recognize the systemic issues in our industry that continue to silence and kill the careers of marginalized artists. Instead, this white refrain frames the white male as an individual operating in a vacuum where racism, sexism, and ableism doesn't exist against BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ people and attempts to create a sympathy by a reverse racism. But what we must remember when encountering ignorance like this is that there is that is that there are no systemic issues affecting cis white hat male musicians. In the same way, systemic issues continue to affect the livelihoods of BIPOC disabled and LGBTQ plus artists. There is a difference. <laughs> In this article, I have referred to a recom figuration of our industry that is needed in order to correct the biases toward white cis hat male artists. If this is to happen without further expansion of the current finite funding resources and opportunities, the reconfiguration will in fact mean that white cis hat male artists will be given an equitable amount of funding resources and opportunities. This will mean that, for example, in the orchestra world in the U.S., where cishet white male composers, dead and alive, enjoy a monopoly of 60-70% to 70 of rehearsal and performance time, they, white cishet male composers, will have considerably less orchestral opportunities within their own demographics. A demographic which we cannot forget has enjoyed an economic reality in which all other demographics are exploited to support the success of of them, of the white cis hat male musician. Being equitable as a white cis hat male artist then means having less, but this cannot happen unless people change. People in charge work through their own white frag fragility and white ignorance and stop using constructive ambiguity to distract us from the much needed equitable change. D'Angelo writes, I quote, one way that whites protect their positions when challenged on race is to invoke the discourse of self-defense. Through this discourse, whites characterize themselves as victimized, slammed, blamed, and attacked. Whites who describe the interaction in this way are responding to the articulation of counter-narratives alone. These self-defense claims work on multiple levels. They identify the speakers as morally superior while obscuring the true power of their social positions. The claims blame others with less social power for their discomfort and falsely describe that discomfort as dangerous. The self-defense approach also reinscribes racist imagery. By positioning themselves as the victim of anti-racist efforts, they cannot be the beneficiaries of whiteness claiming that it is they who have been unfairly treated. Though a challenge to their position or an expectation that they listen to the perspectives and experiences of people of color, they can demand that more social resources, such as time and attention, be channeled in their direction to help them cope with this mistreatment. See footnote 69. End quote. D'Angelo continues with, Quote, the language of violence that many whites use to describe anti-racist endeavors is not without significance, as it is another example of how white fragility distorts reality. By employing terms that connote physical abuse, whites tap into the classic story that people of color, particularly African Americans, are dangerous and violent. In so doing, whites distort the real direction of danger between whites and others. 
The history becomes profoundly minimalized when whites claim they don't feel safe or are under attack when they find themselves in the rare situation of merely talking about race with people of color. The use of this language of violence illustrates how fragile and ill-equipped most white people are to confront racial tensions and their subsequent projection of this tension onto people of color. See footnote 70, end quote. Change in our industry will not happen unless white people in charge and those steeped in whiteness face their own fragility and ignorance. If we continue to be distracted by the same conversations in EDI committees, conference meetings, and social media, we will never become an equitable industry. I, for one, am tired. I'm tired. I'm really tired. <laughs> I know I am not the only one who deals with fatigue and activist work and deal with the guilt that this work takes up considerable emotional and physical resources away from my artistic and academic endeavors. I still hope this article may help to change our industry and guide organizations as they work on their EDI statements and plans. Constructive ambiguity is used by the U.S. to further its colonial and imperialist agenda even today as it continues to create ordered chaos. See footnote 71. It never fucking ends. It's also become embedded in the EDI statements of Wacom organizations. Constructive ambiguity was used by Kissinger to destabilize the Middle East and cement the U.S.'s crude oil supply chain. It was used in South America foreign policy to distract the support the U.S. gave to several extreme right-wing coups. The same concept is being used as a tool by Wacom organizations, consciously and unconsciously in certain situations, to further delay the inevitable equitable change we, I, demand. We must work to get rid of this ambiguity in our EDI statements and plans and firmly act. Although many people have argued against initiatives like affirmative action in the U.S., alternatives such as merit-based and blind auditions, for example, tend to be biased towards cis white hat male musicians. See footnote 72. This is because merit-based and blind hiring practices assume that we are all treated equally in our economy, and I hope I have shown and reminded this is not true. Merit-based and blind auditions are passive and ineffective ways to support EDI initiatives. Concrete EDI goals must be set to reconfigure our industry, and we must end the passive and ambiguous practices we use which continue to distract us from true equitable change. Work through your white fragility and ignorance, step aside if and when need be, and support an equitable industry long-term and sustainably.